men in my life. The men in my life. <laughs> so I said to Shakespeare, Bill, I got a question. I'm in the show called What It's Like to Be a Man. Basically, I'm in the show. I wrote the show. The show and me are like this. <laughs> now, I grew up with you guys. In fact, my best friend from the time when I was one till I was seven was a boy. And to tell you the truth, it didn't seem to make much difference, him being a boy and me being a girl. Well, until we went to school, that is. Now, you've got a lot of men in your material. Ever think about them as a group? <laughs> <laughs> well, Markelia, Bill says to me, Bill like to make little kind of joke poems on the names of things. Markelia, would you put that on the table? Hello, careful, Capiago. <laughs> well, Markelia, he says to me, I'm not sure I get the question. Can you flesh it out? What exactly are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'll do, I'll give him my best shot. I met my first man when I was born, the doctor. Not too long after that, my father, older brother, grandfather, the worst. And to tell you the truth, I noticed that they all kind of felt bad about themselves in some way. I couldn't figure out why. They seemed like nice enough guys to me. I, I like to think of them as dear, sweet male persons. Now, Mind you, the women I met felt bad about themselves, too, but in a different sort of way. And we'll get to that another time. <laughs> well, Bill gets really excited and starts telling me that this is exactly the question he's been asking himself ever since he was a kid. Why, he used to father, follow his father around, try to stay as close to him as he could in the mornings when his dad was getting dressed, when he was shaving, trying to, like, drink in who his father was, what he thought why he did the things he did. Right then, there's a quick knock on the door, and in walks Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Not the older presidential type, this younger kind of guy, khaki shirt, khaki pants, looks like he just got out of the army. But he looks so sad, forlorn, like, like his mom had just died, only she hadn't. I checked later. <laughs> <laughs> well, hiya, Dick, how you doing? Glad to meet you. Why, you motherfucking cock-sucking guy? Get back to later on as well. <laughs> hey, 
looks and underneath that cherry tree looks like he's with Fred Astaire. <laughs> and they actually make kind of a cute couple. Hmm. Well, then I start hearing this little like waterfall behind me. I turn around and there's Vasco da Gama, Allen Ginsberg, and Nebuchadnezzar all standing in a circle around this little tiny bush, pissing. <laughs> Just right. Just like you are. Nothing to do. Nothing to change. Just be as fully and completely yourselves as possible. That's all. Each of you is a treasure. <laughs> you, you, Especially you. <laughs> well, we all just kind of stood around in the quiet, listening to ourselves, listening for a while. Then Job of the Hut starts up this quiet checkers game with Howdy Doody in the back. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman and Carl Marx found a microscope somewhere in the world, running around trying to look at everybody's nose hair. Even Napoleon chilled out. The men in my life. The men in my life. When I decided to do this show, I said to myself, well, let me interview some guys. So I did. I asked many, many questions that I've made up and changed and depended on who I was talking to. But some questions I asked almost everybody. One of the things I asked every man that I interviewed was, what do you like about it? What's something you like about being a guy? What's great about being a man? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can go all out. I don't have to hold back. My dad trained me to, to test my limits, not accept them. <laughs> Why, well, there's been times when I've had to dig down deep inside me and find strengths I, I didn't even know I had. Well, that's happened to me. Well, I, I like being a man. I just can't wait till I get a little older. Well, I know how things are built. Like cars. Take cars, for instance. Now, now I might not know what's wrong with it or how to fix it, but I sure as hell can tell if the guy who's supposed to be fixing it is trying to dick me around. <laughs> 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 hey, I, 
tell how strong I could be. <laughs> I feel power. I take up space. I'm supposed to. I like the way women treat me. Like I'm special. You know, being a guy means that, that if there's a bird in building or, or even a cat on a tree or, or an accident or, or somebody breaking in somebody's apartment, I'm the one they call. I'm the one they call to like to like come and handle it, to take charge and, and set things right. I like that. People expect that. I mean, it's not like I don't get scared or nothing. It's just that it's, it's nice having people believe you. Most of all, it's that I can get really, really angry. That I can like yell and scream and shout and kick somebody's butt if I have to. And nobody thinks I'm crazy. Just kicked off. <laughs> Then there's those times we're all standing around talking bullshitting girl sex, whatever. Even if they're lying. Well, even if I'm lying. And even if I know that they know that I'm lying, there's, there's just something there. I, I can't explain it. They know things about me without me saying anything. When it's good, You want to know about my first ejaculation? Oh, let's see. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in years. Um, I was in my bedroom. No one else was home, of course. I think everyone went out for ice cream or something. And there I was, you know, just doing what I knew felt good. And then all of a sudden, whoops, all over the place. <laughs> I mean, the stuff shot right out. Over my sheets, over myself. How was I surprised? I thought I broke something. I never knew until then that it could be so big. I mean, 
mean, it was huge. He was a couple years older than the rest of us, and we'd be chained in the boys' locker room, and I'd just stare. I mean, the, the other boys you know, all noticed, of course, and would tease me, saying, Look at Rod, stare at Michael Stick. You know, so we're all standing around out back behind the school on a Saturday, uh, passing this dirty picture of a girl, wide open, trying to jack off. Um, Peter came first. Sometimes men you knew, they grab you or something and make you suck them off. Is that being molested? <laughs> against the wall, not talking. Me, I was crying. Deep, gut-wrenching sobs. I, I couldn't help it. I don't even think I really understood what was going on. I, I just couldn't quit crying. Everybody saying to me, Denny, Denny, quit your crying. But I couldn't. Finally, to, to shut me up, one of my uncles took a dollar bill out and shoved it in my hand. I quit crying like that. <laughs> In my family, nudity was no I never saw either of my parents without their clothes on. And I mean all of their clothes. Black Southern Baptist, now North. Probably the only nice thing I remember about my father is his chest hair. He had thick, dark, curly chest hair. And lots of it. I remember one night I was in my room getting ready for bed and I looked across the hallway and his door was part way open. He just finished unbuttoning his shirt all the way. I dropped whatever I was doing and ran, I mean ran, <laughs> burst through the door, threw myself into his arms, grabbed around him and hugged, hugged as tight as I could. He was so shocked, he could scarcely mutter out the words. Well, good night, son. <laughs> <laughs> until we were in the driveway and nobody else was in the car. 
We spent the whole day together. We did everything I wanted to do. For, for lunch, I ate a hot dog and, and drank a Coca-Cola. If I went in the water, he went in the water. I mean, the whole day, I kind of walked around in a daze. Like, I couldn't believe this was happening. <laughs> Even now, when I'm telling you, I'm thinking, well, maybe I made the whole thing up. He died not too long after that. I was 10. You know, on, on that day, for the first time, I could tell my father liked me. And he knew he was dying all along.
the building kind of reminded me of my elementary school, the way the boys' and girls' room were on the basement floor on opposite sides of the corridors. When I got out, I was standing in front of this huge open field, twice as big as a football field in length and width, covered with worn grass and dirt. The whole building, the whole field was under barrage of mortar, so there was like flashes of orange smoke and, and dirt spraying up like water in fountains. On all four sides of the field were these buildings, all the same color, their windows blown out. Except for the mortar, no sign of anyone or anything. All of a sudden, a small white dog with brown spots runs across the field, his whole body tilted at an angle, his head to match. Then the scale of the dream gets really close, like it had wrapped itself around me. While I, while I could still see as far as I ever could, I had a strong, tangible sense of the space about 10 feet all around me. Then the trembling of the ground told me that tanks, a lot of them, were headed this way from behind the buildings I had just left. With me standing out in the open, with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide, all of a sudden a, a chain link fence appears to my left, running about eight feet and then stopping right out in the middle of nowhere. I turn and dash for that fence. I throw myself on it, pressing my face into the links, gripping them with my fingers. At the same instant I get to that fence, a young black man throws himself right in front of me into the same fence. I could tell he's in exactly the same predicament as me. He too lost his people back up back there somewhere. He's very dark, high cheekbones, short hair, about 17 or 18. He's my size. He's wearing a blue cotton shirt, and I can see the sweat stains right under his arm. I reach out and, and touch his shoulder, and he turns and looks at me. Such love. Such compassion. The knowledge exchanged that both of us shared, that things, the world, with or without us, would work out someday. could somehow rest there together. Then the tanks break through the last line of the building, separating them from us, and the bits their machine guns start breaking up bits of dirt and grass around our feet. Taking one last look, he violently pushes himself off the fence and runs off the field to my right. I follow him. He was at the most eight, ten feet from me. As he moved into that place where no mortar had been seconds before, I saw the bright orange flame of the explosion him fall forward and lay still. Me, still gripping the fence. Voices my own in my head telling me, make a break, run for it. There is no time for this, no time for this in the war. Bits of dirt and grass as a machine gun fire gets closer. I release the fence and run half went over to where he lay. I reach out and touch his shoulder. I'd already known he was dead. Goodbye. Goodbye, my dear one. Goodbye, my friend. I break away and run zigzagging towards the buildings waiting silently for me on our left. That giddiness in my head that none of the bullets that were everywhere had hit me yet. I had to make sure. Make sure he was dead.
the desperation that gets me. I've never known another man who wasn't desperate in some deep, deep way. Some way that we feel like we'll never really, really ever be liked. Not for who we are. We just try to never show it. It's not sex I wanted those times, I, I know that. It's the chance to be close, to think that maybe somebody cares about me or is at least willing to pretend that they do. Sex is a dance, right? I know that. It just seems that it's better than nothing. When the sex works, the closeness, the closeness thing, the sex itself isn't that important. You know what I mean? Now, I, I have something I want to tell you, which is that my mom told me that if I did everything that she said to do today, that you would buy me any superhero I want. <laughs> I think I want Spider-Man. Billy, Billy is my best friend. Billy's got Hulk Hogan, and I like Hulk. He's okay. He's, I like him, and a lot of people that I know have him, but I think I want Spider-Man. Because Spider-Man is very strong. He can climb up the sides of the buildings. And my father knew Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> now, if anybody touches Spider-Man, when I get him, and, and I didn't say that they could touch him, I am going to bash him in the head. <laughs> I wrote a song for this show. I think of it as a love song lullaby. I grew up in Chicago. Richard Speck grew up in Chicago. And I think when I was about 10, I first heard of it. He was the first mass murderer I'd ever heard of. <laughs> now, I grew up the hard way, a lot of time. And I dedicate this song to Richard Speck. And I think of it as a love song and a lullaby. And I wrote it for him and for me and for all of us who feel we at times we pushed so far out we felt like we didn't belong anywhere. I love you. 
have witches and tigers and bears where you left by your lonesome, robbed of your own dreams. Richard, I'm sorry we should have cared and come laughing and dancing, culling and snuggling. Let me know then what we know to say now that you're part of the cops dream, that you're only a human who slipped through our fingers. Richard, I love you. Richard, I'm frightened. Richard, I'm sorry. We were not there. Richard, I love you. Me and five guys were on patrol, sunny day, normal fare, nothing special. All of a sudden, a sniper starts trying to kick us off, so we all dive into this shallow ditch, obviously mad day that it started sinking. All of a sudden, a pop grenade comes in right next to me. Without even thinking, I dove on it. That's how I lost my legs. They carried me back to camp, screaming and passing out. But you know, right before I dove on it, knowing exactly what was going to happen. This tremendous peaceful feeling comes over me. Oh, when I helped someone. When I saw my son for the first time, he, he was three, and I decided right then and there to, to do right by him, to not leave him like my father left me. Well, I, I mean, I may not be able to be a very good father, and I probably won't be, but I want my son to know that, that if he needs me, I will be there as much as I can. Most human? Well, I guess when I'm with a group of all lesbians, will they accept me, accept me completely? My closest friends were all lesbians. Well, I guess that says something about me. I don't know. I feel relaxed, like I can be myself. I don't have to be like somebody else's idea of a man. I mean, I never felt like I made it so good as somebody else's idea of a man. With them, I, I can just be me. No, you're going to think I'm weird. No, no, no. Most human? No, no, no. <laughs> You know what I thought of when you asked me that question? Being in my mother's womb. No, oh, I can't remember that shit, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I probably didn't know what I was then, if you know what I mean. I mean, I guess that could be it. No, you didn't think I'm weird. But you know, it feels okay to me. It's like, no problem, no problem. Ah, oh, when I take care of my mother, she lives here in New York City. She left, she lives here ever since she left Puerto Rico. She's got asthma so bad she can't take care of herself. So I like bathe her, I feed her, I take care of her, I change her. Most human. When I do for her what she did for me when I was a kid. Last night in the shul, when me coming made it a minion. The weather was terrible, <laughs> but they called me and I came. Who knows if really cares how many.
any of us were there. <laughs> to me, it made a difference. <laughs> it's Texas time. We're going down south, everybody. I paid $15 for this pair of glasses. And I borrowed the hat and I put them together and found out I had a little problem. Oh, so, we ain't got no problem tonight. We'll just leave the glasses for when I put them in the hat. So it works. That works. I can live with it. So, gentlemen, now this is something you do not get to see every day in your life. No, sir. Feast your eyes and hold your breath. Here he comes. <laughs> Ain't he gorgeous? Prime, lean, meat. Not an ounce of fat on it. No, sir. Not your everyday cut of beef now, is it? Now, man, do not be afraid to test this fella out. Run him around the block, kick his tires, gun his engine, whatever suits you, if you know what I mean. With brief, intermittent rests. This padrone is ready for action. <laughs> now you might have noticed that this fellow's in the Caucasian persuasion and from our circumcised line. Now if that is not your cup of tea, do not let that bother you. We got every man and every model. Your imagination is the only limitation. We got Mahatma Gandhi. We got Che Guevara. We got Roy Rogers, she's a little quick on the draw, but some ladies like that. We got Gumby, the special dickless model. And we got Jesus, the almost never been used. For you men watching your wallets, we got your generics. We got your generic big boy and your generic tall fella. But as you men know, size is not everything, so let's talk features. <laughs> Port o call. Port o call. Extremely important. And believe me, we have spared no expense. And now, what I personally like to think of as the pleasure barge. Let me tell you, this this area, in my opinion, lays to rest any naysayers as to how this organ in its entirety has remained the single most highly treasured, highly valued organ in the history of the world. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> and now, something so special and so right, they made too. <laughs> If your little missus gets nervous when the party's over having this cowboy around, well, just slap a pair of these on and give him my hat and tell her he's your friend from Texas. Thank you, kind. You can stop by any day of the week. We don't keep back for hours. Excuse me here. Come on. My dog died. Oh, I know I was lucky to have a dog in the first place, but when he died, look, either you want to go out with me to the prom or you don't. Tell me yes or no, but don't dick me around with maybes. Don't tell me you're thinking about it. This is what I should have said to her. Don't tell me you're thinking about it. If what you're really doing is waiting to see if somebody else. Rick. Rick, he's my best friend. Rick and me were playing basketball out behind his house and he 
Saturday morning. Well, actually, we were just shooting hoops. Him first, then me, more or less. Well, all of a sudden, Rick starts playing real hard, like dribbling all over the court, like he thinks he's Dr. J or something. I stand there looking at him and think, shit, it's fucking Saturday morning, and I got to look at this. Every time he goes by me, he like hits me in the shoulder, though, just to let me know he's there. <laughs> then he cuts in real close, and I think, what the hell, go for it. So I steal the ball away real smooth, like dribbling, spin around, jump, and shoot and make it. After that, we were playing the ball hard, basketball, b-ball, no breaks. We were buzzing. We were sweating. We didn't stop for a second. We were making three-pointers, hook shots, layups. We were making shots we never made before in our lives. I mean, neither of us even played that good. It was incredible. It was so right, I, I couldn't even believe it was happening. I mean, then he like quick fakes me out to the left, goes in to make a shot. I turn and look at him, and, and I don't know what happened. All, all of a sudden, I start crying. I'm standing there crying in the middle of the court. I mean, I don't know what it was, the sky, the sound of the ball and the concrete. I mean, even his garage door looked pretty to me. <laughs> I go over to his backyard and sit down and look at that for a while. Then he hears me sniffling and asks me what happened. The ball hit me in the nose. <laughs> well, we both knew it. <coughs> All the way. To the limit. All the way. That's where I wanted to go. I mean, there was nobody around. The nearest village must have been 50 miles away. I couldn't believe it. And I'm standing there with this guy I've never met before in my life. I mean, I mean, we just happened to be at the same place at the same time. I was so scared, I thought I was going to pee in my pants. Brandy? That's my dog. Well, in order to get him, my dad made me do chores for six months straight without messing up once. It took me almost two years. <laughs> I did it right, and I got Randy. I love that dog. Used to race home from school just to be with it. My dad said doing the chores and everything, he was training me for success. He said, you do things right out there and they love you. Everybody's your friend, but you mess up even once. And they never forget. There's no such thing as a real second chance. I guess he's right. Billy? Billy, my friend? We, Billy and his older brother and me, we all went to the creek the other day and Billy's older brother put a firecracker in the fish's butt and blew it up. I got fish blood stuff all over me. Well, after that, we played all day. We climbed trees, and we played, and we went in the grass, and we, we did a lot of things. Tommy, that's Billy's older brother. He made me put the firecracker in the fish's asshole. Do fish think? I mean, I couldn't believe it. We were high. We were up on this cliff, a hundred feet, a hundred feet. We're talking ten-story buildings. If you got really close to the edge and looked over, you could see this river going by. Real small, like. All of a sudden, the sky starts humming in some ancient Indian dialect. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I got myself all the way to Peru. Let alone, I'm standing on this cliff with this guy who's still getting ready to jump. <coughs> and I'm thinking about jumping with him. What am I, crazy? So two days before the prom, she gets one of her girlfriends to tell me that she's sick. She even stays home from school just to make it look good. Nobody set my mind even though I had asked her out, so I didn't say nothing when I heard the guys teasing Richard about taking her. 
The night of the prom, I just made out like I was going for it. Of course, Sides went to the tux, borrowed the car, kissed my mom and dad goodnight, and drove around for three hours. After that, I couldn't take it, so I came home. I told them she got sick, and I had to take her home early. <coughs> what a fucking waste. My mom still thinks she's going to see pictures of the two of us. Well, Rick's mom killed herself a few months after that. Rick says she never even wanted to be alive much, but I don't know. Seems to me like if you go and you have kids and everything, it's got to stand for something. Rick's dad married some woman who used to be a secretary, and they all they all moved to a house away from here. I never talked to Rick about that day. thinks about it, too. Well, I, I never really got to say goodbye to Randy. I mean, he died, and, and we buried him in the backyard when I was getting ready to go to college. Princeton. Well, after a, a few years, my parents moved to an apartment. I mean, the house was too big to take care of, and I, I never went back that much anyway. Now I've got three kids of my own, girls. They've been, they've been getting after me to get them a pup. Kind of got me to thinking about Randy. Good dog. Thank <laughs> you.